era in the 50s and what have you because the treatment from my operators uh, toward the blacks that actually patronized and rode the uh, transit systems, simply walking on this bus and putting your fare in this fare box did not necessarily guarantee you uh, that you were going to be boarding the bus or continue on with your, with your, uh, tra your transmute, if you will. Oftentimes, what would happen, depending upon the uh, atmosphere, the attitude of the operator on that particular day, you can pay your fare here, exit this bus, and literally go around to the back door where he was then required to open the door, but he didn't necessarily have to uh, open the door for you. So oftentimes, many patrons would be left standing at the back door, even though they paid their fare, left it on the side of the street. Oh, wow. Depending upon how he felt. But typically, you would pay your fare at this point, deboard the bus, exit the bus, and enter the bus through the back door, and just those seats behind those bars were relegated as the colored section only. But even that wasn't guaranteed seating, even though you paid the same fare as the white patrons. If, in fact, a white female or white male needed that seat, then you had to get out of that seat and stand up the rest of your uh, commute at home. And I think at the time when Rosa Parks literally defied uh, that ordinance, if you will, she was sitting typically in that third or fourth seat right there. And she was the one that was selected and chosen uh, is because she met all the criteria, i.e., she wasn't the very first to actually defy that ordinance. Yeah. Uh, she was one of many, mm -hmm. male than females. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was the best in terms of she being married, mm -hmm. uh, she's being employed, uh, 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 been a member of the NWCP at that time, mm -hmm. uh, all the time. So therefore, the uh, trailblazers and the fathers of the civil rights movement decided that this is the case that we wanted to move forward on. So then you just call the legal arm of the NWCP along with the leadership of Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy, and here we are today. Come a long way and yet still have a long way to travel. We've gone from the back of the bus, we can now actually drive the bus, actually be the CEO of a transportation hub, and also the chief of, of the police of mass transportation. For our viewer and audience who may not remember this, the millennials, can you guide us through some of these pictures in the actual seat where you say Rosa Parks would have sat? Okay. Some of these pictures right here you see uh, the mother of the movement, Mrs. Abernathy, Mrs. Juanita Jones Abernathy, along with the husband to her right, Dr. Abernathy. Uh, and a man is only half as good without his wife no matter what he's doing. And uh, to his right is obviously uh, Congressman John Lewis. In this picture right here, you see the great civil rights advocate and icon and luminary, both of them pictured right there, his wife right by his side, and Dr. Abernathy obviously giving the speech. And these right here, at this time when uh, Dr. King uh, was uh, called to be the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, uh, was only 25 years old, and Dr. Abernathy became his closest and dearest friends. They both appeared to be almost the same height. I think they were both about 5'8", if I'm not mistaken. Wow. So they weren't uh, statuesque men like myself. They were uh, small in, in stature, but as they say, big things come in small packages. And here on this right, you see again, the person that we're honoring today, Dr. Abernathy, his lovely wife. I don't know those two people right there pictured in that photo. And this guy right here, I forgot his name, but he's a historical figure. I'm gonna learn his name because he was the one that uh, the Hoover administration uh, tried to always disqualify his input. He was a strategist behind uh, the movement or the face of the organization, but they could not have made it without the secretary right here. Uh, he was uh, obviously homosexual, and they labeled him as being communist, so they kept on trying to disqualify based on those type criteria. But Dr. King was being the, uh, as inclusive as he was, they could not have made it without this guy right here. And of course, that's the... Uh, uh, historical figure, Dr. Uh, John Lewis. And here you see movements still being led. Anywhere, almost always, wherever you see Dr. King, you're going to see his right-hand man uh, somewhere in that vicinity. And even back here, you see the same things, too. Dr. Abernathy wound up uh, pastoring Dexter, I'm sorry, West Hunter Street Baptist Church. And here are some additional photos of that. Now, you mentioned that Rosa Parks would have sat in the fifth row. Probably which is the last right here, or, or, or yeah.
this one or this seat right here? The so last this, two of the white section. Right, on this side over here. Mm -hmm. And the black section or the colored section, wasn't no black section back in that day. This was the colored section right here. But these were not absolute or guaranteed seats even though you paid your fare. These seats were predicated upon, one, uh, no white person needed these seats. If white people needed these seats, then you had to get up out of your seat, give it to them, and you would stand here the rest of your commute home or wherever else you were going. And if the bus was full and, they could, and there was no room back here for blacks or colored, they would have to just take the next bus? Uh, take the next bus or he'll yell that out to you. Get on the next bus. And that's the way things were. But when the uh, civil rights movement or the bus, bus boycott began, you probably couldn't find uh, one or two people on any route, on any bus. Uh, they, uh, what they call that? when uh, Carpool. Uh, road, walk, however it, whatever it took to get there, that's how they got there. And they eventually brought out their whole year of nobody riding it, brought the, uh, uh, Birmingham and that mass transportation to their economic knees and drove them to the bargaining table. And now we've gone, like I mentioned before, pardon the, uh, my being redundant, from riding at the back of the bus to now actually driving the bus and being CEO of the mass transportation. Wow, thank you so much. Oh, I'm honored. Uh, for our listeners, we'd like to thank you so much for your time today. This has been a historic walk through history and time. What is your name? Dr. J. Thomas. Dr. J. Thomas, and what do you do for MARTA? I'm an operator. been here now for 22 years. Wow, so this is special. So this was like a MARTA bus back then. Absolutely, that same circa. This wasn't the original bus. That original bus is still reserved in the archives as a national treasure and historical monument in Birmingham. This is but this is in that same era of time. This bus was actually uh, uh, in transportation or used from 54 uh, to 74, so actually 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it's now reserved in the uh, museum in Duluth or in Gwinnett. If our listeners wanted to learn more about this, about the bus, about MARTA, about you know how it was back then during the Civil Rights Movement, is there a website or a museum, or how could they find out more information? Let me introduce you to a guy right now that spearheads that with internal affairs. He'll be able to direct you okay. as to how you can connect. Uh, hi, so um, my name's Adam Shoemaker with MARTA. We, um, this is a, a 1953 historic bus that served in Atlanta Transit System before before it became part of MARTA uh, from 1953 to 74. You can find this bus though at the Southeast Railway Museum up in Duluth. It's on exhibit for the public anytime you want to see it and other of our historic rolling stock. Uh, you can find that up there, uh, Southeast Railway Museum, and uh, that's, uh, you can look it up online and find it out, but uh, you can come uh, climb on the buses anytime. They're available for the public's viewing up there. Thank you so much.